Fantasy Football Junkies, you are tuned in to the number one source for fantasy prognostication. It's Testosterone Fantasy Scores with your hosts, Chef and Jesse. So listen up. Here's your chance to gain the edge over the competition and dominate your fantasy football league. Every week we break down all of the matchups and tell you who to play as well as who should ride the pine. This is the joint that every fantasy junkie needs. So check it out. Saturday night is here and you know what time it is. It's testosterone fantasy sports up in your grill. Jeff and Jesse doing the show that we love to do. Jeff, good to be back on the set with you. Riding high, two Minnesota Vikings wins in a row. Another show out there for the Fantasy Junkies. Week 7 NFL upon us. Yeah, I know. The fantasy football season is flying by so quickly. The NFL trading deadline uh, just passed this past week on Tuesday. We saw a big-time trade happen that it totally affects the fantasy football landscape. Uh, the fantasy football trading deadline just a few weeks away, right. right around Thanksgiving. So a lot to go over here on today's show. We're going to get started as we always do. We love the purple and we're going to be happy for at least a little while about a purple victory against the Lions. Absolutely. I mean, those of you that tune into the show on a weekly basis, you've come to expect all of the knowledge you need to help you dominate in your fantasy football league. You've checked our website out, testosteronesports.com. We drop tons of fantasy relevant information there as well. But we also love the Vikings, as Jeff said, and we will start the show off this week as we are wont to do, talking about the Purple and the win that they had last week. Jeff, it was a little bit of an ugly win. Let's face it. I mean, (laughs) the team scored zero points on offense in the first half. They were trailing the hapless Lions three to two at halftime. But after everything shook out, a big play from Bernard Berrien in the second half definitely uh, delivered a must-win victory for our squad. Yeah, well, he picked up an 86-yard touchdown, a very nice play from a big play wide receiver. That was good to see. Uh, As far as that game goes, the the thing I want to say is, you know, a win is a win is a win. And we'll take it when we can get it. And thank God for Dan Orlovsky. (laughs) The, (laughs) The play was awesome, man. It was just one of the coolest blooperific oh. football players I ever saw. Yeah, I mean, J- obviously, if you watch the game, you know what play Jeff's referring to when Dan Orlovsky not only stepped out of bounds in the end zone, but ran like the entire length, width of the field, right. out of bounds, looking downfield, trying to find an open receiver. Didn't even realize he was out of bounds. Jared right. Allen was like whooping and hollering. Yes. Celebrating right in front of him in his field of vision, and Orlovsky's Orlovsky, still looking downfield yeah, for a receiver. Yeah, he looked like a seventh-grade quarterback. <laughs> he has no. He seems to have no field presence out there at all. And you know, I wonder if he knew he was even in the end zone in that situation. I, it, it, it appeared to me that he did not. And I mean, <laughs> when it, when this play happened, as funny as it was, I was I was actually uh, at home with my kids. My lady was out of town for the weekend, so I was doing the the uh, basically single dad deal all day at home with three kids. And uh, my oldest boy, Clay, comes running upstairs to give me the update. And he said, Dad, the Lions just had a safety, but it wasn't a real safety. And I was like, what do you mean? Is there two points on the scoreboard? He said, yeah, there's two points, but it wasn't a real safety. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he he didn't get tackled in in the end zone. And I said, well, still, you know, did did he step out of bounds? He said, yeah, but you got to see it, Dad. It it wasn't a real safety. Jeff, after I saw the play, (laughs) it wasn't a real safety. No, (laughs) it wasn't really a safety, no. It was worth two points, but... But at the same time, and how old is Clay, man? Like eight? Yeah. So and yeah. an eight, your eight-year-old son understands the rules of the NFL better than Dan Orlovsky. <laughs> Something's going on in Detroit, and I don't know what it is. One man who's extremely unhappy about it is John Kitna. Yeah. He's been placed on IR now, and he's come out and said, why am I on IR? I'm not injured. Yeah, basically he's got a back pain, back problem, but they, they're the Lions at – 0-5, I believe they are, or 0-6. Uh, I don't know if they've had their bye week yet, but they, they're a terrible club. And they're, they're basically going to go forward and see if Orlovsky has any answers, which I could tell you he doesn't from watching him play last week. They're also going to give Drew Stanton a, a, a chance. But I really think, Jeff, uh, that the Lions absolutely, absolutely, without uh, John Kitten, have a chance at running the table 
and going 0-16. They just suck that badly. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, NFL teams tend to eventually get things going and can get a victory. Uh, e e even the, the hapless uh, Miami Dolphins last year, they got that one victory. One win. Uh, the, the Detroit Lions remind me a lot of that team. But, you know, against us, they played a really strong team defense. And I wanted to touch on Adrian just a little bit. Uh, one thing I think we're seeing is we've touched on this before on the show, and that's that when uh, Adrian's on the field, every player on defense is totally keyed on stopping him. Right. Nobody wants to be part of his highlight reel. Everybody wants to. It's a pride thing for defenses. And we're seeing that uh, big, stiff defense against our favorite player. And it's disheartening, Jesse, to say yeah, the least. Absolutely. You know, he did get things going to the tune of 111 yards on the ground. 25 carries, which is good for him, 4.4 uh, on the ground or something like that. Uh, but no, no touchdown in a game when we should have done a lot more. He was surprisingly quiet. Yeah, Adrian Peterson is yet to blow up this season. I mean, he doesn't have a single run of 40 yards or more on the entire season. And we're talking about six games here. You know, I mean, the season is uh, quickly reaching that halfway point. We've yet to see that monster outing from Adrian Peterson. In fact, on talk radio on Monday, I actually heard people talking about uh, Chester Taylor and Adrian Peterson needing to split carries because Chester Taylor's just reading his blocks much better and, and uh, hitting the seams at the right time and finding more room. And it's just so hard for me to think that Adrian Peterson is uh, being contained by defenses where Chester Taylor is able to exploit the defense. I I'm, not, I'm not going that far in saying let's bench Adrian Peterson. That's just idiotic, even though I did hear some buffoons talking about setting Adrian Peterson down for the first half of this game against Chicago, which is asinine. Well, and see, what I don't but get in this situation is Adrian's why is struggling. It, why does it have to be all or nothing? Right. You know what I mean? And I, I, I don't think they should split carries e either. But at the same time, I would like to see Adrian get a few less for Chester to get a few more. We have to do something that's going to put opposing defenses on their heels to keep them guessing about what's going on. But when we roll up uh, with in our big package, we've got a fullback offset to the right, and we've got Adrian behind him and, and a tight end. Everybody knows we're going to run the ball. Absolutely. Everybody knows we're going to get the ball to Adrian Peterson. Right. So then the whole defense plays a little bit stronger, and they right. stop him for a two-yard right. loss. Right, and Adrian, we remember his first NFL touchdown last year in, in week one, Jeff, was on like a 55 or 60 yard reception for a touchdown. Right. I want to see some inventiveness right. from head coach Brad Childress. I mean, a lot of people in this game were, were really complaining about the play calling again, right. saying there's no inventiveness by the offense. Adrian Peterson is a weapon. And when you have a weapon like that, you've got to get him the ball in space. Mm -hmm. Let him make some big plays. It's just shocking to me to think that Brad Childress uh, comes from the Andy, Re Andy Reid regime where they use Brian Westbrook in so many I different know. capacities. They get him the ball all over the field. If we would use Adrian Peterson that same way. Maybe he's not quite as polished as a receiver as Westbrook, but dude, he's just as dangerous in a broken field, and he's never getting a chance like that. Yeah, he, every time he gets the ball, he's swarmed uh, uh, around by four or five defenders. So I'm with you completely. The, the creativity in our offense just isn't there, and it, it, it brings to mind the, the, the fact that Brad Childress, while at Philadelphia, never called plays. Never. So he's a head coach now who never had any play calling experience coming in and and the offense is so vanilla you know at least throw some sprinkles in there you know yeah, Chester, screen pass. Chester Chester has has thrown a touchdown so we've gotten a little bit into that but there's really no creativity uh, in the running game at all uh, Chester's uh, touches are ve very restricted and then our fullbacks aren't the same yeah we really miss Tony Richardson he's plowing the way up in uh, in New York for the Jets and helped Thomas Jones get into the end zone twice in their last game. Right. And we just Reno Mahi and or not Reno Mahi, but uh, Tahi Thomas and Thomas Tapay. Just they're not cutting the mustard right now, and it just it feels to me like maybe we should go back to the two tight end set because when Adrian's back there, you can't tell which way he's going, and at least. You give him an edge that way. Well, they've got to do something different offensively. I mean, let's face it, the Detroit Lions are not a good defensive team. Uh -huh. They came out. They look pin, good against they, us. They pinned their ears back. They had four sacks in the first half of that game. Coming into that game, they had four sacks all season. So I'm calling out the offensive line here, too. I mean, uh, we have McKinney back. I think there was a little bit of rust on him last week. I'm hoping he plays better this week. But Burke and Hutchinson, those two guys are not 
uh, they're not playing at that Pro Bowl caliber that we expect them to play. The, 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 the holes just aren't there at this point. And Ryan Cook, dude, you looked like a disaster yeah. last week. Yeah, it's been a struggle to watch. The right side of our offensive line seems to be breaking down. Uh, the left side hasn't been much better. You know, the Lions, they were getting tons of pressure on us. Tons of pressure. And it wasn't su a surprise that we didn't score because every time Farratt stepped back to pass, he had somebody in his grill. And, right. And, and, and they did a great job defensively. The defensive coordinator would uh, delay his blitz and send e uh, Ernie Sims uh, late. And we, uh, Farratt took a shot. A couple from big Sims. shots. And I'll tell you that, you know, when the defensive line is able to collapse a pocket like that, it makes it really hard for an offense to do anything at all. So all they had to do was stop Adrian and collapse our pocket, and everything unraveled for us. And I mean, essentially, for a second week in a row, what we've seen is Bernard Berrien win the game for all us. Right. He made the one long play uh, two weeks ago against New Orleans on a touchdown catch, and they set up the winning field goal with a pass interference penalty. The same script happened again here this week. Long touchdown catch by Bernard Berrien, which, I mean, really was the only explosive right. play we had all day. Bobby Wade had one, uh, one decent catch as well. But Bernard Berrien, that one explosive play, and then realistically, Jeff, a phantom uh, interference call late on right. Lee Bodden set up the, the – I mean, we won that game by two points on Dan Orlovsky's idiotic play. And it's the second game in a row that yeah. we've gotten down all the way, almost all the way down the field due to a, a penalty. Yeah, and this time it was a real phantom. So, yeah, it really so was. So the, the club has to step up because coming this week, the Chicago Bears, we will travel to Soldier Field, Jeff, and uh, people at home will be able to go onto our website, testosteronesports.com. They'll be able to see a clip from the sports yeah. fan movie that we were involved right. in a couple years back because we've been to Soldier Field, Jeff. We've watched this club, and we were followed by documentary filmmakers while we did that, so make sure you check it out online testosteronesports.com but Jeff this environment that this club is moving into is a pretty raucous environment this week at Soldier. No, no hang on man this clip is is the whole clip on there because I remember there's some partial nudity in that clip I don't think that so. I'm not necessarily comfortable with and it'll be it'll be only on the website <laughs> web only I mean I've known some other people who've had some partial nudity on the web only and that's kind of turned bad for them It'll be good. <laughs> Web only. It's just Jeff's keister. I mean, it's a nice keister. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go that far, but you definitely want to take some time out. We do a Web only segment every single week. We've been doing the TFS Classics uh, a couple weeks in a row now, so go on there, check it out. The sports fan clip, it's a riot. It was on uh, Fox or uh, Spike, Spike TV. TV a couple years back, produced by John Stewart from Comedy Central. We're advertising it in our scroll throughout, right there it is actually, right on key, just like we planned it. So go <laughs> online, check that out. But as I said, Jeff, well, we're hoping that this week's game is going to be a little different than the game that we went to, where brutal. our offense put up only three points. Brutal. This, this time in Soldier Field, I'm hoping that we're able to hold the opposing offense to just three points while we put up much more than that. I do think it could be a very low-scoring game, Jesse. Uh, both teams match up pretty evenly. We both run the ball well, or supposedly, uh, and play strong defense. Neither team has a great kill-you type of uh, passing game, so this should be a lower-scoring game, and hopefully we're able to be effective on defense. One thing I'm concerned about is that uh, without E.J. Henderson at the middle, are we going to uh, let Matt Forte run wild? Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping we don't let Forte run wild. Let's remember we still are uh, fourth in the league in total run defense, but you're right, you know, missing out on a playmaker like E.J. will probably make it a little easier for Forte to uh, find some running room. And the Bears had a brutal beat last week. They took the lead on the Falcons with 11 seconds left. Matt Ryan came back and beat the Bears. So I know they're going to be very hungry. Mm -hmm. They're playing in their own place. But realistically, Jeff, to me, this, this, it comes down to one man and one man only, and it's Adrian Peterson. Let's not forget, last year at Soldier Field, Cat ran wild. Mm -hmm. 224 yards and three touchdowns. Had that big play at the end of the game on the kick return yeah. that came basically was set up the winning points for us. So if Adrian Peterson does not go off in this game, I don't think we can win. We need a big game from Adrian. Yeah, it, it really needs to happen. And, and for the team cohesion and rhythm's sake, we, we got to get that running game going. It's, it's our bread and butter, so it, it has to happen. Uh, as far as this game goes, you know, you mentioned the, the 
the tough loss that they came off. Uh, you know Lovey Smith, he's really good at preparing his players. One reason I really like him as a head coach is he seems to get all or more out of his guys. Absolutely. He gets them to sell out for him and give them their 100% effort every time. So he gets effort out of guys who you normally wouldn't see performing at a high level and because of that they're winning right now right I, I understand they're three and three we're tied for the division with them but at the same time in soldier field they're a pride filled team that knows how to hit and loves to play stingy defense it's going to be tough for our boys to come home with a vic well two weeks in a row on this very show i have pulled out the horn and blown the horn two weeks in a row the vikings have won we want you to stay tuned with us through the next 45 minutes or so here on the show i will pull out the horn at the end of the show we'll blow the horn loudly trumpeting the Vikings to a win, but we're going to take a brief break right now. We'll come back and start dissecting all of the fantasy football matchups. Thanks for joining us. Week number seven, Testosterone Fantasy Sports. Skull Vikings. <laughs> to win you must tune in to testosterone fantasy sports <laughs> Thank you.